All right, good afternoon everybody for the last session of the day. Um, I'm going to talk about securing single page applications. Um, before I start, it might be useful to, to ask you who knows what single page applications are, who has experience with them. Okay, a few people, that's good. Um, the other ones will hopefully learn something useful and the people who have experience, um, if I'm missing something, feel free to uh, to fill me in on some details you know or some experiences you encountered. Okay, first of all, um, I'm Philippe. I'm from the University of Leuve, from the Tisselnet Research Group. I recently finished my PhD on client-side web security, which is uh, very relevant for single-page applications. Um, right now, I'm um, working around the training program on web security, uh, of which this course is uh, one of the first steps. Um, so we're going to have a training on single-page applications at the OWASP OPSEC conference in May. Um, so if this is interesting, uh, that session will even go deeper. So um, you're invited to subscribe to that as well. I'm also the author of the Primer on Client-Side Web Security, one of the books that's available um, in the raffle uh, if you fill out your evaluation forms. So be sure to do so. Uh, in the book, we focus on client-side web security. Um, we have uh, about seven attacker models, which we break down in capabilities. And uh, for each of them, we start analyzing which kind of attacks are possible on web applications, especially from the client side. We cover 13 attacks, their countermeasures, both um, things you can deploy right now, things that are available in our research, and we uh, have an overview of best practices. So as a developer, um, it's very useful. You have a kind of a checklist, okay, this and this and this are things I definitely want to deploy. That's enough about me. Um, let's talk about web applications. And more specifically, um, well, let's start with traditional web applications. Um, I have a small schematic of what a web application used to look like. You have the browser here, you have a server um, sitting somewhere on the internet, and uh, you have a form you want to fill out. So what happens if you do that? You enter some data, okay? Uh, this is a new task, some description. I have to cook something, uh, apparently a few days ago. Uh, yesterday, I think. So if you want to add that to the list, um, what will happen is that a request will be sent to the server, a post request asking to create a new item, um, the server will parse the request, store some data in the database, and since this is a traditional application, the server will have to build a page to send back to the client, to the browser. So he will retrieve some data from the database, in this case all the tasks to display, generate an HTML page, and send a response back to the, the client. This is the HTML code. At the browser side, um, when you receive a new page, um, it loads a new context. So it loads a new context with this code uh, it receives from the server, and it shows you the page that it has just received. This is the way web applications um, have worked for quite, so, quite some time now. This has, some certain, this has a certain flow and some disadvantages as well. So um, what we see here is that the browser is only the view. We get some display code, basically markup lang language, what HTML stands for, and we display it. That's about it. Everything else happens at the server side, including all the controls that need to be embedded in the HTML page. If you have a menu bar, uh, you need to encode all the operations in the HTML page for the user to be able to use them. Okay, then this started evolving because this was kind of static, uh, static scenario, so we started to introduce some kind of API, which we could use, use uh, with Ajax. So let's say we want to resort this page, and we don't want to do it on the client um, for some reason, then you can make an API call to sort this data using a certain column, and um, you can receive a snippet of information which you can use for partial updates. So in this case, we just receive some um, HTML data in, as a response, which includes only this table. So we can easily um, load this table instead of the old one, and you have um, kind of a, a more performant look and feel, and maybe a better user experience. This is um, a few years ago um, when things like Google Docs started to be created um, and Google made a spreadsheet which allowed partial updates uh, a good user experience. This, however, still resembles the, the old model. So we still have the server doing a lot of processing. We still have the server generating views and we simply use the client to display these views. This does not entail a full client-side application. You may use uh, Ajax in a, in a very extreme way to actually create some kind of an application, but it still heavily depends on the server. If the server is offline, you have no application because nothing will happen. Uh, no updates will get through and you will not be able to update something. Um, and you heavily depend on the server-side processing. 
That's different in a single page application. In a single page application, what you have is, you still have the browser, of course, uh, there's no way around that, you still have the server, but you actually load an application into the browser. And in this case, we have the same uh, functionality as in the old application, but now if we um, enter some data into the form and add it to the list, the application will add it to the list um, immediately. This is stuff that happens on the client. You will immediately see a table with a view, uh, with a task you just created. That's very nice. And in the background, the application will contact the server, of course. Um, it's not a client-side application. It's still a web application. It's the cloud. So um, you post, send a post request to the API on the server, and it does roughly the same thing. It parses the request. It stores the data. You created a new item. You want to store this. Okay, very nice. And then you send a response. In this case, we already have all the data, so the only thing we want to know is whether the, uh, the storage of this item was successful or not. So you can just send a, an OK response, like, OK, everything is fine. Or in case there is an error, like, OK, no, we don't want to allow this. Um, and if this is an error, the client-side application can um, notify the user, like, OK, apparently something was wrong with this task because, um, I don't know, it existed already, so you cannot uh, add the same task twice, for instance. Of course, this is also a check you could have done at the client side. What is different in this model than uh, in the previous one? Well, we have a client side application, so we gain some, uh, some things which mainly lead to a very good user experience because whenever we send a request to the server, this happens in the background, so we can keep working in the application on the client side. Imagine a spreadsheet application like Google Docs. This is very nice, you can keep working. And in the background, uh, operations are sent to the server and information is retrieved and the user essentially doesn't really notice the communication anymore. Also, if something goes wrong, let's say that there's a lot of latency on the connection, you still have a responsive UI at the client side. With an old application, you hit send, and then if the network is down or is slow, you have to wait and wait and wait, and you start doing other stuff and you forget about it, and it's basically not a, not a very good user experience. Of course, this brings some challenges as well, because now you have an application running in the browser. You have some of your business logic probably running in the browser, but essentially you cannot trust this to be, to be good because anybody can contact your server and send requests. So you have changes in the architecture of web applications that you have to take into account, that you have to account for when designing and building a replication. Also, if you want to change the view, uh, let's say you want to use a different sorting, this all happens on the client side. The server doesn't have to be involved for that because essentially it's nothing you want to push to the server. It's nothing you want to store, nothing you want, uh, you want to persist or something like that. So in this talk we'll cover four, uh, four topics. First we're going to talk about um, what's behind a single page application, what's, what is in the architecture, um, what will happen, what technologies do we use to achieve uh, such a, an experience. Next, we're going to talk about authentication and authorization, which are still important. You have an application with personal data. You want the users to authenticate themselves. You want uh, to restrict access to certain APIs, um, which mostly reside on the server. So there is a way to do that, and there are some technologies you can use there. We're going to talk about injection vulnerabilities, cross-site scripting, um, of course, one of the major problems on the web. But the good news is, if you do this right in a single-page application, you can get rid of cross-site scripting. Uh, no more of that um, if you do it right. So that's a good thing. Of course, there are also ways to screw it up badly. So that's a bad thing. And then finally, uh, we're going to talk about remote API access. Because we have a server-side API, which still contains the the most important part of the application, the data, the logic, and of course you need to ensure that uh, access to that API is secured uh, from unintentional access through CSERF or intentional access through course. But let's start with the beginning, the architecture of a single page application. So if we have our uh, task application here, this looks fairly trivial, so um, we're going to explore what's behind it. Here you have a part of the application to create new tasks. And then at the bottom of the page, you can see an overview of uh, tasks that are pending. And you can also move to an overview of completed tasks. So here, um, if you enter some information, um, this will be entered in the view of tasks to complete. That's, uh, that's a very nice user experience that we have. But what's behind this is data binding. So essentially, in uh, a single page application, they support a way to bind the input fields here to some data that's stored in your model at the client side which is in turn uh, showed in the view. So in this case, um, this happens automatically. You, well, 
you have developed the application so that this happens automatically. You enter something here and it appears in the list here. <coughs> Whenever the user confirms it using add to list, then you can start processing the background request to the server to store it and things like that. We also can switch the view to show completed tasks, for instance. Um, if you want to do that, that triggers a navigation that uh, looks the same as in traditional applications, except you don't load a new page, but you load a URL which stays within the browser. So um, you notice that this URL is the same as the one from the main page, except we have the hashtag and some path. Um, the hashtag is um, no, known as a fragment identifier, and that's a part of the URL that always stays on the browser. Um, traditional applications use this um, if you have a lot of sections on the page and you want to skip to a certain section, this is what you use because you already have the content, you don't need the server to tell you where you have to go. The browser just knows, okay, I'll go to that section. In this case, um, we do something completely else with that, but we use this uh, technique to hide the path in. What we will do with this, this part will um, be used for routing. So at the client side, this is a code example from AngularJS, uh, the framework I will use for reference in this presentation. Uh, a Google framework which is uh, quite extensive and quite good in my opinion. So what you do here is somewhere at the client you define um, routes that can be used in the web application. So you have the overview route which is essentially this part of the application and you uh, define if you, if you want to show this, follow this route, we have this template we want to load and in the background we use the controller which offers certain operations to perform in that view. Same here, the completed view has uh, this route has a, a template and a controller that's associated with it. If we follow this, the framework will take care of the routing and will um, load the completed tasks um, in the application. All right, um, what happens to load this completed tasks view? Um, well, um, if you, okay, sorry. Um, this is what the user will see after, he has, uh, after the routing has completed and this is the code that's behind it. So, um, well, this is an abstract version of the code. I left out a lot of details, of course, but essentially you have an HTML tag like you used to have, and of course you should close it here. Um, and you define an ng app. ng stands for the Angular uh, prefix, so everything starting with ng is something from AngularJS. And essentially, um, this tells the, the scripts you have loaded from AngularJS that um, it has to process this as an application within the browser. And this enables certain features like routing, controllers, views, uh, all those things. This box um, represents the part to create a new task. I've omitted the details because um, there are well, basically some uh, input fields and things like that. Not really that much that interesting for here. Then here we see the view for completed tasks. And we only see a container, a div container with ng view. That's it. Um, and why is that all? Because this is where the view will be loaded. And if you remember from this slide, if you navigate to the completed uh, view, th this route has a template URL. And this is where this template will be loaded. So um, AngularJS has templates and controllers. Other frameworks, um, by the way, have something that's very similar to this, but they may use other technology. So that's why I always prefix it with AngularJS, so you know what I'm talking about. So this is the HTML page we want to inject in this container. Uh, and this is the controller that's behind it. What do we see here, uh, technology-wise? It's plain HTML, that's fine, but Angular supports some kind of uh, control statements. So here we can uh, we create an unordered list and we tell uh, AngularJS to repeat the list item for every task that's in the, that's in the list of completed tasks. Uh, okay, that's kind of nice, easy way to create a list. And within the list item, we want to show the deadline of the task and the description of the task. And um, the stuff between these angular brackets, um, also called mustaches, uh, if you're interested in that, um, this binds to the data that's loaded. So the task refers to the task here, and the deadline is a field of the task um, within your model. Um, the list of completed tasks is uh, fetched from the scope here, um, which essentially is within the controller and allows you in the controller to uh, expose certain data to the view um, to expose functions to the view, to do whatever you want, basically. Um, this is how everything is stitched together. So you load a template here, the template uses data that comes from the controller here, and uh, everything is constructed together in the, the routing information you have coded in the router. 
We also have additional features, um, which I'm not going to go into detail here. We, AngularJS offers the definition of directives, um, which they call it, and essentially they correspond to custom HTML attributes or elements. So um, you would, for instance, uh, be able to create a task directive, and then you can use the HTML element task to define a task, which is, uh, can be very nice in, in your own applications. Um, we also have filters if you want um, to filter this list uh, first through a, a list of we only want tasks related to cooking, then you can implement such a filter and uh, show a partial list. Um, but these are security-wise not that interesting, so I'm not going to talk about them. So that covers a bit of the, of the technology we have in the browser. Of course, we also need a backend. And while you may be able to use a traditional backend, um, one of the advantages of single page applications is that you can use a lightweight and uh, flexible backend. The keyword here, uh, well, the, the responsibilities here um, are threefold. Um, first of all, you need to serve static files. Your application, your browser application, still is HTML and JavaScript and CSS and whatever. So you need to be able to serve them somehow and provide them to the browser so it can start the application and start executing it. Next, you need to provide access to the business logic through an API. Of course, you have, uh, in, in our case, you have items stored somewhere. You want to create items. You want to enforce uh, access control on that. So that has to be in an API somewhere. And you want to store your data persistently. Um, one important note is here, or one important concept, is to know that the front end and the back end are completely decoupled from each other. So you have an application running in the browser and you have an API running on a server. And essentially, they're not related uh, at all. So while you traditionally had an application which creates some views and pushes, pushes it to the browser, now you have two completely separate things. And this is important because if you don't consider them to be separate, then you will start making errors by putting business logic on the client and putting access control checks on the client and exposing your API to uh, malicious users. So if you consider them to be separate, then you have an API on the server with clearly defined interfaces where you implement your uh, desired operations and where you enforce the necessary access control. control. You can implement this API uh, independently from the application, you can test it independently, and you can make sure that the API is airtight and only offers the operations that are needed. Next, you have the application running in the browser, which again is something, something different. Um, the only connection is that the, API, uh, the application in the browser uses the API to fetch data, to store data, um, to interact. But other than that, it, it has no relation to the server side backend. And again, that application you can test. You can write tests for it to ensure that the application works the way it should be. Um, also, one advantage of this decoupling is that the language of the front end and back end are, again, not related anymore. So you can easily write the front end, it's probably JavaScript, of course. But the backend can be any language you want. You have uh, Node.js, which is very popular uh, nowadays for writing backends. That's a JavaScript uh, style backend. But you can have other languages as well, such as Java, .NET, uh, basically anything that supports kind of a REST API. So who here knows what a REST API entails? OK, a few people. Good. So then, um, do you know how old REST is? Any idea? Yes, very good. So you know it. Nice. Um, yes, it was basically described by the guy that also described the HTTP protocol. Um, but it's only, well, it re with the recent development of single page applications, it has become quite popular. While uh, before that, it was maybe used uh, for some APIs, but not used very often. What does it look like, a REST API? Um, I stole this from a tutorial on the web somewhere. Apparently, they make an application for uh, bear management. So um, I don't know why, but OK, let's go with it. So you have an API. Uh, well, you have a pod slash API. And um, you basically have different routes um, on the server side this time and different HTTP methods. So if you send a get to this, uh, this simple pod, then you get a list of all the bears. Straightforward. If you want to create one, you send a post to this path, and uh, you provide some data, and you create a new bear. And these two are fairly straightforward, and these are the more interesting ones. Here you can uh, inject an ID, 
and then you can get the information from a single bear. So for instance, if you go to slash API slash bears zero, then you get the information of uh, bear zero. <coughs> you can also use put and delete, which a get is simply, it gets some information, it shouldn't change any state, so uh, gets are typically considered safe. But puts and deletes uh, actually change information. And they're considered to be, um, well, if they are abused, they can be very harmful. So you definitely don't want a malicious attacker to be able to send deletes in your name because it will start deleting information on the server. These will return later when we are talking about exposing our API to third parties, for instance, using the course uh, policy. So what are the properties? Well, what are some relevant properties of a RESTful API? First of all, you have a clean separation between client and server. And this fits well within the fact that you have a separate client-side application and you have a backend which are decoupled. These APIs are typically stateless. Um, if you remember, as we will see with authentication in a moment, uh, a traditional application keeps some server-side some server state. Um, an API, a RESTful API, uh, shouldn't keep any state on the server. This is great if you want to scale it up. You just throw in a few more servers. They don't keep state anyway, so they can just serve single requests and you don't have to keep track of where a request goes. Um, you have caching. The, the idea behind REST is that responses are either cacheable or not. A very binary decision. Um, not, um, yes, it's cacheable if you leave out this and this and this. It's either yes or no. So this uh, makes caching fairly easy. And you have the uniform interface as we discussed before. Like I said, you have different options for backends. You have the more heavyweight enterprise frameworks like .NET and Java. They support uh, the development of a RESTful API. This might be useful if you already deploy them in your company, then you can use it. You have the lightweight JavaScript-based tools or uh, other language uh, tools which are still lightweight. You have Node.js, you have Go. Um, there are plenty of options there. And if you want to go even lighter, apparently now, nowadays there are REST-enabled databases like CouchDB, which allow you to serve some static files and just expose their data through a REST API. Uh, they can take care of authentication and authorization as well. So basically all you need to do is deploy one thing and you're, you're serving files. Uh, I'm not going into details about whether that's a good idea or not. I think you can uh, make up your own mind about that. All right, um, how do you consume a REST API? You have XHR, traditional JavaScript. This has been around for quite some time as well. So you have a URL, an XML HTTP request, that's the object. You open it with a certain method and a, the URL. And then um, you attach an event handler and you send a request. If the request, well, the response is uh, received, this will be triggered. Um, you check whether it's in the final state and if the status was successful. And if so, then you know that the bear was deleted and you can um, remove it uh, from the client-side application as well. If you have to write this to consume an API, that becomes quite painful, uh, especially if you do a lot of operations. So um, the single page application frameworks offer some uh, tool support for that. AngularJS has, I think, at least three methods for consuming a REST API. You have the HTTP res uh, service, which is quite basic. You have the resource, which uh, can transform um, well, create uh, objects from uh, resources uh, from, from data objects, and you can um, uh, execute operations on that. So for instance, here, we just um, define a new resource with an API located here, and we delete it with this, this ID. Then you have uh, callbacks, uh, success and error callbacks. Uh, recently, they also started supporting promises. So if you like JavaScript promises, then you can use uh, those instead as well. You, have, um, you also have REST Angular, which is a a library for Angular, uh, which offers some other vision on how to consume a REST API. Um, this is, well, I think personal choice of the developer. People like certain ways to consume APIs and make a framework for or a plugin for it, and that's uh, how they, they see it. So that's roughly what's behind a single page application. And this brings us to the next part, which starts to go into security and uh, some interesting topics. So authentication and authorization. First of all, maybe before we continue, are there any questions about the introduction? All right. Authentication and authorization. Um, first, let's go back in time and look at traditional server-side session management. What we have here, um, we have a browser, we have a web server. In this case, it's a newspaper. What happens if we visit a newspaper? Um, at first, nothing much. 
we send a request. Um, it's a plain request, no cookies, no whatever. So the server doesn't know who this is going from. He starts a new session with a session identifier, stores some information, in this case we're not logged in, and sends a response to the browser. He attaches the cookie containing the session identifier to this response, which the browser will store. If we now send the next request, for instance, to authenticate as Philip, the browser automatically attaches this cookie and sends it to the server. The server gets a cookie with ID 1. He looks up, OK, I have a session that corresponds to this, so I'll process the request within this, this session. I see that this user is not logged in. OK, fine. Um, let me check the credentials, and if they're correct, let me update my state. So now, uh, within this session, uh, the guy is logged in, and his username is Philip for future reference. And we send a response. If I want to read some news articles that I haven't read before, I'll send a request, the browser attaches the cookie, the server fetches the state and gets me the latest articles I haven't read. Fairly straightforward. What happens if we, a second browser does it or a second user does it? It goes to the web page, a uh, new session is created, uh, sent back with the cookie, which is then used um, for further requests and uh, that's about it. One side note, uh, you shouldn't use session identifiers that are sequential and are a single digit. So you should use some uh, <coughs> large random value and you should use your uh, framework library or whatever for that. Um, but that's not for this talk. One important thing here, the cookie is a bearer token here, which means that any request carrying a cookie will uh, be processed within the session that belongs to that cookie. Um, this is important for attacks such as session hijacking or session fixation. Properties of server-side sessions. Um, they make the server-side stateful, so um, it's not a stateless API like a REST API, so this might be a problem. Um, and it's definitely difficult for load balancing situations, because if you have multiple servers handling requests, and one of the servers has a session, and then you'll have to distribute it over servers or make sure that requests from one user always end up on the same server, or something like that. So that becomes a bit difficult to manage. The server, however, has full control over sessions. Uh, why is this important? Well, the server can easily expire a session. If you decide that a session should be expired or should become invalid, you simply delete the server-side data and the session is gone. Even if the browser presents identifier 2, if you don't have any session associated with 2, you don't, uh, well, nothing will be able to be executed within that session. You can keep track of active sessions if you want to. And you should adequately uh, protect the session cookie because it's a bearer token. How does this compare to client-side session management? Um, in client-side session management, you still have the server and you have um, the browser. And what happens here is um, you send a request. Um, again, no cookie is attached. The server will create a new session and will store some uh, state um, within the session. In this case, it's the um, you're not logged in. This is not stored on the server side, but instead it's sent as a cookie to the client. So we encode the entire session, put it in the cookie, and send it to the client. Okay, since this is a cookie, the browser will attach this to any future requests. So here we want to log in, and we send the state back to the server. The server sees, okay, we're not logged in. He verifies the credentials as before, and um, okay, I'm, now I'm logged in as a user, Philip. But we, want to, we don't want to store this, so we send it back to the client. We just put it back in the cookie and give it to the client, um, which now well, has some kind of state. Next request, I want to see news I haven't read before. OK, I attach the cookie again. Server extracts the cookie, sees, OK, this is the user Philip, fine. Um, I'll find some articles that he hasn't read before and send them back. OK, notice that here uh, no cookie is sent because no state is updated or no session state is altered. So there's nothing to be stored. Same thing happens if a second user does this. Um, we create a new session, send it back, and uh, send it back whenever an update is received. So um, what could go wrong here? Any suggestions? OK, yeah, definitely a problem. Good catch. Also, a second one, the cookie still remains a bearer token. So um, also, you should protect the cookie because anyone who has the cookie um, has this, uh, well, can be associated with the state. OK, so what are the properties of these server-side sessions, uh, client-side sessions? 
Now we have a stateless API because the server doesn't have to keep track of states because any state is sent along with a request. That's good. This allows us to implement a nice REST API. Um, what are some disadvantages? First of all, clients can modify the cookie, so we should take that into account. But also, session expiration becomes more difficult because now, whenever a cookie with a session object is presented, we just use it. Um, so we'll have to implement some mechanism to make sure that we can expire these sessions. If we don't do this, then a session will remain valid forever. Um, Okay, um, that's about everything I have here. I noticed that I still forgot to make one slide. Um, I wanted to show um, what this looks like in a real life application. Um, but yeah, okay, I'll skip it. Um, my apologies for that. What I wanted to show here, um, I forgot about this, is that if you implement this in a browser, then you will see the cookie being stored at the client side. The cookie looks unreadable, but it's actually just base64 encoded. So you can easily decode it and see the state stored at the client side. I made an example of this with the Express framework um, on Node.js, and there a signature is added to the, the cookie. So you have a second cookie containing a signature, which used a secret stored on the server um, to generate this signature with an HMAC. And essentially that suffices to prevent the client from modifying this data um, and giving you fake data because then the signature wouldn't match again. So these are the things you should do uh, to protect client-side session data. Even if you use another mechanism than cookies, um, store a minimal amount of data because it has to be transferred uh, every time and, uh, on every request. So if you store like a megabyte of data, um, that's kind of a problem uh, for these requests. Prevent manipulation with the signature. Um, if you want, you can even encrypt the entire contents of the state. Uh, if you store sensitive information, for example, or maybe even if you store something that's uh, regulated, like credit card data, I don't know what you want to store. In that case, you can use encryption um, because the client doesn't need access to the cookie anyway, or the, the state if it's transmitted in another way. And you should include some expiration um, dates if you want to, um, so you can eff effectively expire a session. So there's one example with cookies. Um, this is supported by uh, the cookie session middleware for Express. Um, essentially, it's, it's trivial to configure. You configure it the same way as uh, another cookie-based session management, and uh, the framework takes care of all the rest. Here, they actually store a second cookie containing the signature, which is always transmitted as well. So the server can verify that the session has not been tampered with. Um, and one of the main advantages of using cookies for this um, is that the browser knows how to handle cookies. And even if you have requests that are uh, not sent to JavaScript, not through XHR, but for instance, getting an image where you want to enforce access control, then the cookie will be attached to that request as well. So that is one of the advantages. One of the disadvantages of doing this is that you still have problems with cross-site request forgery. Um, and I'll show you in an example later why um, that is and what we can do about that. A second example, this is very, very classic uh, using cookies. A second example um, is JSON Web Token, uh, or JWT. Uh, it's actually pronounced as JOT, apparently. Um, I don't know where they got that. It's also base64 encoded JSON data, but they have um, kind of a, a, a fixed structure to follow. So they have a header, a payload, and a signature. And it looks, well, a token looks like this. Uh, it's some unreadable chunk. But if you start to break it down and decode it, um, the first part, the green one, is the header. And this essentially, essentially says the algorithm that has been used and the type of token it is, because it also supports other tokens than uh, JSON Web Token. So this is useful if you want to switch algorithms later on, or you have a browser that only supports uh, some kind of algorithm, then you have a way to encode it. The blue one is a payload. Um, that's essentially the contents. There are some fixed attributes here you can use, like ISS for issuer. There you can, yes? So you must be the algorithm. What is the algorithm for what? For generating the signature here. Oh, I see, okay. Yes. Um, so first here, the payload, that's the data. You have issuer, you have EXP for the expiration date. Um, that's already supported here. And then you can define some custom things like uh, the data you actually want to store. Then the red one is where the algorithm of, here, of this one is used to generate a signature over this and uh, implement it and attach it to, the, to the, the whole token. 
This is currently a draft spec at IETF. Um, it appears to be gaining some traction, so this will be, uh, well, this is already supported in, in several libraries and it will be more widespread, well, support will be more widespread uh, in the coming months, I guess. Um, how do you use it? Well, of course, you can store the whole token in a cookie, but then you have the same thing as before, only now you have uh, a standardized way to store the data. But you can also use the authorization header to attach it. Uh, that's something that's often su suggested to do. And if you do this, um, this has some advantages. The first one is you prevent C server attacks because um, the token needs to be attached uh, manually to each request. Well, of course, um, you can use some kind of a, an interceptor in your framework to do it for every request that goes out. But it will only be uh, attached within your framework. So if a, an attacker sends a request, uh, no data will be attached and it will not be authenticated uh, to the API. The disadvantage is that this is not compatible with cores. Well, it's uh, less compatible with cores because uh, the authorization header is considered a special header and will trigger pre-flight pre requests in cores, which I'll explain uh, at the end of the presentation. You can also embed it as a query parameter that's uh, also often suggested, which I don't think is a very good idea because it will end up in log files. Um, that's uh, a disadvantage, or you can uh, embed it in a form as hidden data. Um, one of the main advantages for using this is that uh, you probably have good support in other platforms as well. Cookies are often not supported in mobile applications or things like that, requiring you to, do imp to, do, to implement it manually, while this may be supported soon. Uh, I don't know whether it is already. I'm not a mobile developer, so I don't have experience there. But if it is already supported, then this is easy to use. Yeah. If I, if I understand correctly, you, you are kind of abusing the authorization header if you put it in, in there, because isn't it the case that the JWT can also uh, contain lots of other data than, than just authorization? Yes, essentially it can. Um, I'm not sure how to respond on that. If you use the authorization header, um, instead of the, the basic or whatever scheme, uh, it's, it's called the bearer scheme, and then you can include a web token. But um, I, su I, I suppose if you include other data than authorization data, um, then, then it's kind of an abuse of the header. But whether you use that header or include a custom header, I, I don't think it, that it makes that much difference. There's a scheme provided for uh, sending bearer tokens using the authorization header, other than the, the traditional username password ones. Um, okay, so to handle authentication and authorization in your REST API, um, you essentially can use the HTTP response codes, um, as you should. So sending a 200 means that everything is fine. If something should uh, be requested without authentication, uh, then you can send a 401 um, requesting the client-side application to provide some authentication data. And if permission is uh, definitely denied, you send a 403. On the client side, you can easily handle this um, using some of the techniques offered by these uh, JavaScript frameworks to build single-page applications. So um, in your router, you typically can specify whether you want authentication for a certain route or not. And if you want authentication, the framework will automatically trigger or will trigger one of your functions to trigger the authentication procedure. If you use, for instance, a modal login dialog in AngularJS and put it in the route, uh, as a requirement in the routing, then um, a pop-up will come asking the user to authenticate and the request will be sent to the server, after which the normal routing request will proceed. Also, by uh, implementing response interceptors, you can uh, check for 401s and whenever, whenever uh, one of those comes in, you um, pop up the login dialog, and after it succeeds, you resend the request uh, for the original data. This is a clean way to implement authentication logic because you only need it in two places, and you will not have to scatter it throughout your entire client-side application. Um, are there questions about this stuff? I guess not. Okay. Then we'll move on to injection vulnerabilities and countermeasures, which is probably a bit more interesting, as interesting, especially because it will allow you to eliminate XSS. Um, fair warning, I will have some questions for you in this part of the talk, so uh, pay attention. 
First, cross-site scripting. You probably heard a lot about this in the past few days. Um, in case you haven't, there are three categories. One is stored in the data on the server side and included in the response somehow. You have reflected, um, which you simply bounce off in the server by embedding it in a URI. And you have DOM-based, which um, is data used by client-side scripts. Cross-site scripting attack looks like this. Let's say you send a request to example.com and search for this. If I'm very, very naive, I will simply echo back, okay, you search for your search term, in this case a script, and it will execute in the browser. This is quite uh, straightforward cross-site scripting. How would you defend against this? Of course, uh, you've been to enough presentations to already know that you should use uh, context-specific output encoding. So you should make sure, okay, I'm using this in an HTML context, let's make sure that there's no HTML tags in there. That's quite nice, but with a client-side application, the server doesn't know where the data will be used. The server simply provides an API which provides you JSON data, and the client-side application processes it however it wants. And that's exactly the challenge we have for eliminating cross-site scripting. Um, so here, we have no idea which context will be used, so the client-side application will have to sanitize the data, will have to enforce some output encoding, and you will have to make sure that the data you get from the server and you use will not result in cross-site scripting. Serious frameworks um, offer these countermeasures because if a framework wouldn't offer it, um, definitely don't consider even using it because this is one of the most basic things you have in these applications and if this goes wrong, then any security guarantees are, are out the door. So um, check if you use something else. I know Angular does it because I'm going to talk about it. MBJS does something similar. Um, I haven't checked all the other ones, but if you use something else, make sure that it protects against the most basic forms of cross-site cross scripting through simple data injection. So, um, now we come to the interactive part. I have some examples of how cross-site scripting can be mitigated in AngularJS, and I want to check if you can see what will happen or guess what will happen with the data. So, what we have here, somewhere in the script, let's say in the controller, he has fetched some data from the server, and this is um, a string. And we're going to inject this into the template. We have uh, an anchor tag, which is an href, and this value will end up here somehow. What do you think happens if we do this? Should we do this at all? I see you saying we shouldn't do this. No. Why not? Yeah, because the, the scheme is a JavaScript scheme, and so it will get executed if you uh, click on that link, for example. This okay, so this is a bad thing. Well, Angular makes this kind of a good thing. So what Angular will do, it recognizes the href is very sensitive, so they have spent some additional uh, time on that, making sure that this is secure. They detect uh, other schemes than uh, the allowed ones. Uh, and in, this, in that case, they prefix it with unsafe, so it will never be executed. This will, you can try all you want, um, it doesn't work. And I think even most recent browsers disallow the JavaScript scheme in content of pages. They only allow it in the URL bar. Um, but whenever you embed it, in, for instance, in an H tag, I think it doesn't even work anymore. But I'm not sure which browsers do it and which don't. So basically, you just did Yes. Which is, in this case, not a bad thing, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, next one. Again, similar setup. We have uh, some code we got from somewhere. And we want to show this um, in, a, in a div container. So we use the ng-bind directive. What happens here? Any idea? Should we do this? Or will we get screwed over? Feel free to shout suggestions, even if you don't know. Um, just take a guess at what will happen. So maybe explain what bind does in Angular. Okay, that's a good suggestion. ng-bind will um, place the data from this variable into the container. So let's say um, this has an Let's say we want to achieve that the image tag is put into the, into the div container and will be processed by the application. I'll give you a hint for the first one. Here, um, this is what Angular produces. So it essentially injects this data here, but ng-bind um, will always produce HTML safe data. So uh, it will never produce HTML tags, uh, and it always, well, it ensures if you use this to inject HTML into a container, it will never be <coughs> never result in something that will be executed or run or whatever. So this is, again, a good thing. Here I have the same example, except now I use ng-bind HTML, which 
will render HTML tags. So this is essentially the one that um, can be used for HTML because sometimes you want uh, to inject some HTML somewhere. Will this go wrong or not? Yes? No. Angular um, knows that this can go wrong and it will uh, prevent you from doing that. So it uh, keeps track of which values um, are considered safe. And safe here means uh, SCE stands for Restrict Context Escaping. So it means if it has been passed through a sanitizer or something like that, then it will be considered safe. Otherwise, it's considered not safe. So it will not be allowed. This is, again, a good thing. I think this, is a, this has been a change in the, one of the recent versions, one of the 1.3 versions. So um, OK, we want, definitely we have to do some sanitizing, apparently. Let's uh, try to do it. Again, here. Um, we have the ng bind, which will not produce HTML, but we also have the sanitize. Um, what will, do you think the sanitize does? Will it produce something? Let's see. Here you have um, the sanitize first strips off dangerous things. Apparently, event handlers are considered dangerous in content you inject. Of course, it's one of the attack factors for cross-site scripting. So. Um, the sanitize removes this part and the ng-bind injects the data um, into the diff container but without HTML tags. Yes? So ng-bind, I take it, does not swap x for a in the source of the image. I assume that's just that an is, error Yes, that's an error on the slide. Okay. Good catch. So, now you should know the answer to this one. Again, the, the A and the X don't matter. Yes, indeed. This is the way to include safe HTML content in your application. For instance, let's say you have some user-supplied content you do want to display. Uh, this is one of the ways you can do it. Um, to get to this function, you need to include a sanitized module in Angular. I haven't shown this on the slides. And that's, once that module is loaded, you don't even need to explicitly call uh, this function. It will, uh, once it's loaded, ng-bind HTML will always use sanitize, um, which is a good thing. Okay, now we're getting close to shooting ourselves in the foot. Um, the SCE service, the strict context escaping, um, has a function, trust as HTML. And when I looked it up for the presentation, the documentation is quite unclear because I had to figure out what it did. And essentially what it does is allows you as a developer to say, I know this is HTML code and I, I know it can be trusted. Um, so I definitely want to, want to use it as HTML code. But we have ng-bind, so this will not uh, produce dangerous code. It's escaped for HTML, so that's a good thing. But here we have ng-bind HTML and we have trust as HTML. So um, this seems kind of a bad idea and definitely this is executed. Um, I'm not sure why they keep supporting this in such a way that you can easily do this um, because I found people online saying that yeah if it doesn't work just use the trust as HTML and uh, you can put your HTML code in your div container or some people even think that this is a sanitization function which is definitely not the case it's uh, the exact opposite of sanitization. So this can uh, lead to problems. Um, but overall, I think from the traditional cross-site scripting to data, through data, I think you can conclude that um, these frameworks definitely have some benefits because they allow you to inject the data um, into the application and they enforce some uh, sanitization of uh, encoding and they definitely make the problem less bad. But that's not all. Um, because these applications, they change the way that the DOM works. So um, essentially, they allow you to um, extend the DOM. They allow you to create new uh, elements, new attributes, and they do them um, to themselves as well. Like Angular has a lot of new attributes that are introduced, and they might interfere with security measures or uh, things we have in place. One example is if you want to um, have a, an application that's heavy on graphing, um, you can create custom elements to represent the graph uh, and bind them to data in the model. And that way you have an easy way to define, define a graph. Um, but this is an extension of a DOM. This might be a problem. How does this work? Um, these extensions, well, essentially 
it's a string to code capability. So in JavaScript, you have eval, you have the function constructor. They essentially allow you to just take a string and transform it into JavaScript code. That's a source of uh, a lot of problems. That's why eval is considered kind of evil, but it's used in these frameworks uh, plenty, which might be a problem. And there's a researcher, Mario Heiderich, um, who thought that this may not be such a good idea after all, and he started the mustache security project. Uh, the mustache comes from this, because if you flip it, it's kind of a mustache. And he, and he thought that this could probably go wrong uh, in some way or another. So what did he do? He assumed that there is an injection vector. Somehow you can inject data into a template, for instance. Um, and he also assumed that there was conventional cross-site scripting filtering in place. For instance, we throw out script tags. We know that they, these are bad. We throw out uh, on error handlers. We also know that these are bad. So what, what can go wrong? Do, do we break any of the existing security assumptions? Does it maybe, is it maybe possible because we extend the DOM that we create additional cross-site scripting vectors? And he found some uh, serious things. This is an example. Uh, the, this is a link to the website where you can find all the examples. This is for Knockout, one of the frameworks. Essentially what you he have here is data bind, which binds something uh, to the div. And by this you apply all the bindings. And this will result in uh, an alert, which is not good. Why is this not good? This seems quite normal, but essentially you have a benign attribute on a div, a data bind, a data attribute, which results in script injection. Um, this leads to the execution of scripts and a filter even a conservative one will not trigger a data bind to be something known to be malicious. It's not an on error, it's not an on load. So yeah, this probably is just some, some attribute for some data, but essentially it executes script. Similar example for Kendo UI, another framework. You have um, content of a diff, which uh, is known to be static uh, data. This shouldn't be a script, but still it's executed as a script. Here's an example for Angular. Um, this is, again, content in a, in a div. It's between mustaches, so it's an expression that will be executed. Uh, and this results in, again, an alert. Um, a fair um, note here is that because of all the stuff Mario did, um, he had a lot of interactions with the Angular people. And this is version 1.5. Uh, and starting from 1.2, these things are not possible anymore. So they they realized that this was kind of a problem and they uh, pushed for stronger security to prevent those things from happening. Um, before I go on to content security policy, um, these things happen or can happen. For instance, um, a normal user will never be able to inject uh, an expression into a div container because that's not how the framework is designed to work. But if you have, if you use this library on the server side and you compose, for instance, a template on the server side, um, you still have some dynamic uh, code on the server, and then you be can become vulnerable for these kind of scripting attacks. And the point of this project is that if you have such a problem, that the scri uh, cross-site scripting filter will not detect this to be a dangerous construct. And that's why if you stick to uh, client-side templating and don't do anything dynamic on the server, you should not be vulnerable for these kind of things. Anyway, let's say we do want to protect against um, these kind of things, then we can maybe use content security policy. Content security policy has been covered in a lot of talks, so I'm not going into detail on the policy anymore. It's, uh, I can say that it's the next uh, big thing on the web. It's uh, an important security policy that will not go away. And what it does is it allows you to specify uh, sources of uh, content you include and destinations of certain actions. But more importantly, it disables inline scripts and styles by, styles by default. It prevents you from using eval and the function constructor because they are known to be problematic uh, in string to code situations. The example from before with the cross-site scripting attack, this will not be executed anymore because it's considered an inline script and the policy here prevents um, anything that doesn't come from ourself to be executed, including inline scripts. CSP is um, meant to be a second line of, line of defense against cross-site scripting. So essentially, you should do the traditional uh, countermeasures. You should output in code. You should uh, make sure that you don't have um, scripts as input. But 
by deploying a CSP policy, you ensure that if there is a hole, an attacker still can execute some script that is severely restricted and probably will fail in the attack, if you have a good CSP policy. The problem with single page applications is that they heavily depend on eval and the function constructor. So they actually need this uh, capability to ensure that they can process the DOM attributes, they can process uh, all the special uh, elements and tags. So they tend to be incompatible with CSP, um, which is not, not a good thing if you want to push the use of CSP, especially for new applications. Luckily, some frameworks offer a special CSP mode. Um, Angular, for instance, uh, is compliant with CSP. Ember.js um, can be compiled to be CSP, CSP compliant. Um, and other frameworks seem to offer, well, I did a, a search for that. They seem to offer some kind of solution um, to enable CSP, um, albeit not uh, built in in the framework. So how does this work in Angular? You define uh, your Angular application and you simply add the ng CSP um, attribute to that. And this essentially enables Angular in the CSP mode. So this will ensure that Angular doesn't use the eval and the function uh, constructor anymore. So if we have, um, I have three examples of potential cross-site scripting vectors here. Um, which ones will execute? Uh, any guesses? Um, Sure, let's say that the policy um, doesn't allow any inline script to run and doesn't load any external scripts. The strictest of CSP policies you can imagine. So the first one, will this, will this trigger an alert? No, you're right, if you try to do this. Um, this is the error you get in Chrome. Um, essentially, it says that no inline script is uh, required. So either you enable inline scripts or you add a nonce to the, to the script to allow it. Okay, so that's good, I guess. The second, um, this is something Angular specific. Will that work? Is this an inline script or not? No, that's true. So. This will work and the second one will work as well. And you're totally right, this is not from the browser perspective. Um, but we, how does this work? I, I have a slide explaining why this works. So what happens when Angular processes these event handlers? So first of all, it scans the DOM and it goes looking for these ng things. I told you these are the Angular specific attributes, so it wants to find them and make sure that they do something useful because by default the browser just ignores them. And then it will um, take them apart. So here, for instance, we have um, an ng click. So in this event view alert um, thingy. And that will be translated into um, an on click event handler. Um, this is not inline code. This happens in Angular code, which is included with script tag. This is allowed. And we define a function where this event is passed through. And then we look up a view attribute on this event and an alert attribute. And we execute it with one. Um, when, whenever this handler fires, this results in the alert box uh, popping up. This is not inline code, this is no eval. Um, so essentially this is one more example of how um, the use of custom DOM attributes bypasses existing CS uh, cross-site scripting countermeasures. Um, the good thing is, this again, this is one of the things discovered by uh, Mario, and this is something that is no longer possible in uh, Angular 1.2, and how did they fix it? Essentially, they cannot disable this behavior because that's kind of by design what such a framework does, and it still needs to work uh, when CSP is enabled. But what they do is they prevent um, the use of dangerous objects. So um, this will still run. You will still have the event. You will still have the view, which is uh, part of what triggered the event, but um, you will not be able to look up any properties that is not directly related to view. So, um, if, it doesn't ex if the alert doesn't exist in view, it will be um, fetched from the window object, which is the global object, um, but that will not be allowed. So um, this will result, if you execute this in Angular 1.2, this will result in an error, and the framework will definitely tell you, like, this is something that's no longer allowed, you shouldn't do this um, bad. So, um, this is very important, um, because it essentially enables CSP to be, CSP to be used, and um, that's quite 
quite good in a sense because um, Google strongly pushes both CSP adoption and Angular adoption, which is not surprising because Angular is a product of Google. Um, and they want you to use it for Chrome extensions and for Chrome packaged apps as well. Um, a Chrome packaged app is essentially kind of a desktop application which runs in your Chrome browser. You can install them and run them like traditional applications, but from within your browser. Um, they're also the thing used on Chrome OS, for instance, so they're very interesting. And there, Google, by default, enforces the use of CSP. If you don't have a CSP policy in your manifest, um, the app will still will just not run. If you're not CSP compliant, it will not run. And you cannot relax the default policy, so there's no um, unsafe inline, there's no eval, um, there's nothing. So in that case, it's very good that Angular supports CSP because you can still use Angular for building such client-side applications. Um, for Chrome extensions, the policy can be relaxed a little bit. Um, it's still enforced to use it um, since their second version of extensions, which was, I think, three or four years ago already. Um, you can still have some relaxations of the policy, but um, in general, you still have a fairly secure um, way of building an application and preventing script injection vectors. Um, why is this so important? Because these browser applications have access to more sensitive APIs than web applications. They, um, the browser exposes certain things to make the apps uh, do something useful, of course, more than a web app, and that's why you have to make sure that you have no script injection vectors in there, and that's why Google pushes CSP so hard for security there. Are there any questions about um, this part? Why do you need to add this ng-csp uh, if you had uh, error in your uh, response? Yes, um, you enable csp, the policy, um, you put a header in your response, that's true. The ng-csp basically tells Angular that csp will be used and that you shouldn't, um, that it shouldn't use eval. By default it uses the eval and the function constructor, but by specifying ng-csp um, it doesn't. It makes sure it uses the other technique. The reason it's not by default is because it has a performance impact. So the NGCSP version of Angular is a bit slower. Um, I've read something about 30%, but that number is a bit old anyway. So I'm not sure what the impact is, but there is some performance impact. Um, but unless you're a major site, I think for the most applications, this shouldn't be a problem and it should be used in combination with a, a good CSP policy, of course. So that's why it's a separate uh, directive. Okay, then I'll move on to the, the last topic, which is remote API access. Um, and basically, I cover two things there. I cover CSERF, which is unintentional use of remote APIs, and I cover CORS, which is the recently introduced policy to enable API access from different origins. Remote access, of course, every access is remote, um, but the answer here is in the origin. So we have same origin access and we have cross origin access. Essentially, what that means is if your own application wants to access the API on its own server, that has always been allowed. That, uh, that has been used a lot. That's what uh, made uh, Ajax so successful. But what has not been allowed until recently is cross-origin access. Meaning that if I write an application running on the SecUpDev website, for instance, and I want to use the Twitter API or the Dropbox API or the whatever API to include some functionality, then now with the course policies, I can use XHR, I can use my Angular uh, REST functionality to consume that API as well. And that's very interesting. Of course, if you build an API, you will also have to deal with CSERF and make sure that you don't have uh, any CSERF attacks. Let's start with that. Um, CSERF has probably been covered uh, a lot as well. Um, a quick recap, so essentially the problem of a CSERF uh, attack is if an attacker can trigger your browser to send a request and the server processes it, processes it as, of you, as if you send it. Um, so essentially this abuses the ambient authority in session cookies. So let's say we have a browser, um, I visited Standard, I'm authenticated, so I have a cookie that authenticates me to this, um, to this website. And I visit another website that sends uh, that essentially triggers a request uh, being sent to this, uh, this API here. Uh, in this case, it triggers a request to change the email address, um, which is not something I intended to be sent. 
if the, uh, but the browser will attach my cookie to it. So if the API doesn't take care of this kind of thing, then uh, it will be vulnerable to CSERF and you will be able to trigger uh, requests from within the browser even though you didn't intend to do. Um, how do you mitigate these things? Well, there are a few different uh, solutions. First of all, if you don't use cookies, then probably you don't have a CSERF problem, which is a good thing, um, but it also makes certain things more difficult. So uh, let's say we do use cookies. Traditionally, you use a token-based approach to mitigate such an attack. And a token-based approach uh, embeds a hidden token in a form, and by doing so, um, if the server doesn't find its own token in the form, then it knows that it's not a request that it intended to be sent, and it will be ignored. Uh, this leverages the same origin policy to ensure that the token cannot be stolen, um, but that's a traditional defense in case you use forms. Another one uh, is the origin header, um, which I'm not going into detail here. Of course, these things, or a hidden token, is not very compatible with an AngularJS application, for instance, because you don't have any traditional forms that have a submit action anymore. You create the forms on the client, and you process them on the client, and your controller will send a request to the server. The solution here is to use a transparent token, um, which uses cookies and headers to um, ensure that it's protected against CSERF. How does that work? Let's say we have a browser. On the first request, the server, um, in this case, it sets a client-side session state, which is not very relevant, except that it exists. And it also sends us a CSERF token, the very secret value 123. Um, on every subsequent request, my uh, client-side application will um, read this cookie and attach it as the CSERF token in a header. So the server now receives um, my session state in a cookie header. That's uh, traditional, well, that's normal. It receives its own uh, CSERF token, it's set as a cookie, that's be being sent as well. And it receives an additional header containing the token 123. Server will compare these two, and if they match, then it knows that the request was sent from the application. Why? Because an attacker, um, which doesn't have access to these cookies, so for instance, um, from the previous slide, um, this website cannot access the cookies from this website, so it will never be able to read the cookie to attach it in a header, and the browser will never attach the CSERF token header by itself. Um, and that's essentially why this works and why this is a transparent solution, because the only thing you need to do on the client side is copy the cookie through a, a CSERF token header, and that's about it. And a simple check on the server side suffices as well. You have no server side state. Everything is embedded in the request and response here. How do you enable such a thing? Um, for example, in the Express framework, which runs on top of Node.js, uh, it's as simple as including the CSERF protection module and making sure that the CSERF token is uh, sent to the client. Um, this is fairly straightforward. How do you do it on the client side in AngularJS? You don't, because it's enabled by default. Um, if you, if AngularJS encounters uh, this cookie, it will automatically copy it to the header associated with it, and um, you have CSERF protection. And this is really straightforward to implement, um, so if you use cookies for authentication, um, that's definitely uh, a good solution. Yes? So in previous sessions this week, we actually always said that a session cookie should be an HTTP only, what you now say is, for well, this particular application, the CSERF token, you have to make sure that the application can read it in order to be protected. Yes, the CSERF token should be uh, readable, but the session cookie shouldn't. So this one, you hide from the client-side JavaScript. Uh, this one, you make available so Angular can read it, um, indeed. But is this also a classical client server? Yes, um, it would if you can ensure that the token is attached to every request that goes out. Um, because if you have a form, then you will have to capture the submit event in JavaScript and trigger an XHR that submits the form data, so you are able to attach a new header to the request. Otherwise, the browser will not do it automatically. But in an Angular application, every request goes out, um, well, every meaningful request should go out through the, the HTTP interface anyway. So you can, well, it's done automatically, and if you want to do something custom, you can um, define some middleware on the HTTP service that does it for every request anyway. Okay, so that's the case for CSERF. Um, now, the, the other case is legitimate API access, it's coarse. Um, what happens if you use XHR to fetch a cross-origin API 
um, something bad, the browser complains that you're not allowed to do so. So here, I tried my application um, is uh, hosted on localhost, um, and I wanted to fetch something from this uh, location, which is also localhost, but the browser considers this to be different because this is, well, it doesn't know that this is the same, and it sees uh, an unmatching origin, so it just complains that they, there's no access granted to my, uh, my code. And we'll see why and what we can do about this. Uh, course cross-origin resource sharing will um, fix this. It allows you to introduce additional headers so you can enable this behavior and you can expose an API that can be consumed by other applications, um, which is very useful. Um, this is, um, there's a site that contains some APIs that are ena course enabled because of course um, the provider has to enable his API to be used. And you see that Flickr has an API, uh, Google has some APIs that you can use, Dropbox, uh, also as APIs, which you can consume for your, from your application and you can uh, do some useful stuff with there. Typically some, some authorization is involved with this, that would be OAuth, that's often used for that and there's a talk about that tomorrow if you're interested in that. So how does this work in a browser? How does this work with course? Let's say we have a website here, uh, this is the newspaper, uh, this runs within the browser and we want to consume an API on example.com. We send a GET request to, uh, for instance, their uh, REST API that serves articles, okay? Um, the browser sees that this is a cross-origin request and will include the origin header. Um, essentially, the origin header is very comparable to the refer header. Um, it contains the source where the application or the request came from, except that it only contains the origin. The refer header would com contain the complete path, so here, uh, this could be, for instance, standard.be slash uh, latest article, um, how much money do I make, uh, for instance. Okay, um, That leaks some information here. It doesn't leak anything except that you were on the website, but that's what the server side needs to know to decide whether this request is allowed or not. Let's say that example.com sends back a simple JSON response containing some articles and no specific course headers. This is exactly what would happen if example.com has never heard of course. If you make a REST API and you don't know what course is, you will never send course headers. So, um, in this case, the browser will trigger a, a, a warning saying that this is not allowed because um, you want to fetch some information from a service that doesn't know it can be fetched in this way um, and it will prevent this from happening. Why is this? Um, I have a slide about that. Um, that's the next slide. So, first, how can we enable this scenario? Okay, um, we have the same thing. We have the GET request, the origin header, the server sends a response and explicitly tells the browser, I want to allow access to this origin listed here. So I explicitly acknowledge that I know that this can happen and I allow standard.be to access my list of articles. Um, the browser will uh, allow the standard.be to consume the response, will allow um, uh, access to the response so the data is loaded into the application and can be shown in a list or whatever. Um, what can go wrong um, if the service doesn't know that this happens? Let's say we want to delete an article. Oh, there's a typo here. Um, we send a delete request uh, to erase article number five. Um, the browser uh, gladly attaches the origin so the server can check this. If the server doesn't know that this can happen, he answers, okay, sure, I'll delete it. Um, send me more delete requests, please. And the browser will, uh, of course, course does not allow this. Why not? Because um, if you would allow this to happen, even if the server would not send any headers and the browser would just deny access to the response, the response doesn't contain anything. It's uh, an empty response. In the GET request, you have a response which contains data because the GET request is to fetch data. A DELETE request is to change state on the server. So we cannot allow this to happen because otherwise all these APIs would suddenly become vulnerable to uh, cross-origin put and delete requests. So course prevents this from happening and introduces a mechanism to enable this. How does this happen? Let's say we want to send this, uh, the same um, delete request as before. The browser detects that it's a cross-origin delete request and will first ask permission to send that request. The permission has the form of an options request. So uh, an options is used in HTTP to um, request uh, metadata from a server, to request the server permission to do something, to get information, what does, do you support, uh, what can I send to you? So here we ask the server, um, can I send uh, 
a delete request to this URI from this origin. And the server will um, investigate, okay, um, do I want to uh, allow standard update to delete stuff? Oh yes, I know those guys, they have access to that API. Okay, sure. It sends back the appropriate course headers. It says, okay, standard .be is allowed to send me get, post and delete requests for that URI. Good. Now the browser knows, okay, fine, I can send a delete request. It sends it with the appropriate header, of course, and the server responds with the uh, appropriate course headers. This is called a pre-flight request. Um, and this happens for every request um, that was not possible with traditional HTML, HTML elements. So you notice that the get in the beginning didn't have this. Why? Because you could do the get request anyway um, with traditional HTML stuff. If you would have, let me quickly go back here. If you would have created an image tag with this URI, the browser would have sent this request anyway. So the, the server side would have processed it anyway and would have sent an image, well, or would have sent an error code or whatever in response. So essentially, course allows the same thing. It gives an error in case that this response contains some data. Let's say it contains an, an index page with some hidden tokens. It doesn't allow this code to access the response because you get this error if you try. Um, but it does allow the request to go through. Um, why? Because the pre-flight, it has a certain impact on the requests. It makes it uh, more heavy to send these requests. Um, but it's needed for sensitive uh, operations that otherwise would cause harm on the server. Why is this relevant? For instance, remember the authorization header from the beginning? If you embed a web token in that, uh, every request containing to a cross-origin API would uh, first require to send a pre-flight pre -flight request. Um, which can cause a certain performance impact. Pre-flights are, well, it's easy to cache them, so browsers are very aggressive on caching pre-flights, pre um, especially to avoid um, having to ask the same permission over and over and over again. So how do you enable this um, practically? If you use the Express framework, um, you simply include the course module, and you give it a list of allowed origins and the framework takes care of all the rest. Uh, essentially, the whole options request handling and uh, all that stuff is taken care, by the framework, taken care of by the framework. Pretty nice. On the server side, do we have to deal with all those response headers? There are six in total because you can also uh, allow cookies to be used and different methods. You can expose some headers. No, of course not. This is done by the browser, so the browser will Make sure that if you send something, the appropriate pre-flights is sent, the appropriate headers are attached, and the response headers are processed, and permission is either denied or allowed. Any questions about this? Because I know that the course policy is complicated. Why can't the uh, server decide uh, when it gets the delete request, you're not allowed to do that? Why can't the, I mean, you have to enable this, why do you need this pre-flights? Yes, okay, let me go back here. Here. Let's say you are the server, um, server software. I've written you 10 years ago. You know I can delete stuff. Um, you get a request, what do you do? Yeah, I check the origin. No, because that didn't exist 10 years ago. That only exists since a year, three years ago. So you have no idea that this can happen. The only thing you know is in my days, when I was developed, I could get delete requests, but the only way to create one was using XHR. And XHR is restricted to the same origin. It's actually funny because once they enabled this, um, a lot of soft well, some software started to break because um, they implicitly assumed that XHR can only use the same origin. Facebook had this uh, scheme where they had um, JavaScript code, which um, where you could specify a URL and it would fetch the URL from the server and load the page dynamically on the client side. Some kind of uh, single page applications uh, before they actually existed. But they assumed that the URL could only be same origin. So they didn't even check the URL, they just fetched it. And if it was cross origin, let's say that you ask the Facebook application to fetch a URL from attacker.com and embed the code into the page, the browser would just bork and give an error. When course was enabled, the browser would happily send a request with the origin header, thinking that the server will tell me when it's not allowed. But of course, I am attacker.com, I can enable the code with the appropriate headers, and it was included in the response. So it's all of a sudden, 
you could, could include any kind of code in the Facebook uh, application that's running in the, I think it was the mobile version. So this, even though they tried really hard to not enable additional attack scenarios, um, if you make implicit security assumptions, some things can go wrong anyway. But that's why the pre-flight is here. So um, let's go back to your situation. You're uh, built 10 years ago. You have no idea what this means. So you'll just, but I, I don't know, whatever. You'll definitely not send this header unless you do some really, really, really random stuff and you get uh, very unlucky, but uh, the browser will never receive this, so it will never send to delete. It will just uh, give an error saying, okay, you're not allowed to send delete here. Okay, so let me um, wrap up uh, very briefly here. Single page applications, um, they're becoming really big. The frameworks um, used on the client side are becoming fairly mature. Um, for AngularJS, they're doing a complete rewrite actually um, because of the lessons they learned doing the first versions, even though they are quite good. Um, version 2.0 will even be better, um, is assumed. Um, it will be incompatible with the previous version. So um, there's a lot of heated discussion going on whether this is a good choice or not. Um, some people think it's awesome, other people think it will kill the framework. Um, we'll see what happens. I think it's Google behind it. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think there's a good chance they'll make it. Anyway, the architecture of a single page application really empowers the client side. So a lot of stuff is pushed to the client, including a lot of security measures like cross-site scripting prevention, things like that. So um, you have to take care of these things in the client um, and at the client side to build uh, good applications. If you do it right, however, um, okay, the image is shaking for some reason. If you do it right, you can build very good applications. You can eradicate cross-site scripting in your application, which is really, really good. Um, security features are available. Um, choose wisely. You can find problem with these uh, community build frameworks is you find a lot of libraries, for instance, for the Express stuff. Um, take a look at how old the stuff is you're using uh, and choose wisely if, for instance, a session um, middleware for the client-side sessions, they deploy HTTP only by default, which is a good thing. Um, they require you to insert a secret key for signing the cookie. They support the use of multiple keys, so you can have key rotation, things like that. Um, make it, uh, I think, quite of a, um, a calculated choice and put some trust in the quality of the software. Although you can't guarantee anything, of course. So that concludes the content of my talk. Um, if there are any questions, we can deal with them now. Yes. This origin header is sent by the hosting? Yes. And if you fake it and you return the rest of the request with your header, how can you show that this is the domain? Yes. Um, what scenario are you thinking of? What? What scenario, what attack scenario are you thinking of? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me go back to the to an image to show what can happen. The important thing here is um, everything that's sent from the browser can be sent from anywhere. Um, if I'm an attacker, I can just connect to here through Telnet and I can write whatever I want. Of course, I can write, yeah, my origin is even example.com. If I don't send an origin header, example.com will think I'm coming from here. So that's something that is always possible, regardless of course. So that's definitely something you should protect against using access control authentication authorization. So what does that mean? That, you, that means that you have some kind of uh, session token or state or authentication token or whatever in the request. Once you have that, if I'm an attacker sitting here, I can send the request, but I'll have to use my own token unless I steal someone, some token from somebody else. But if I use my own token, then this can become a legitimate request. Even if I say I'm coming from wherever, um, then example.com will have to decide whether it's possible or not. Um, if I want to um, use the, the user's token and I send a request from my site loaded in the browser, let's say I next to standard.be I have attacker.com open in the browser. If attacker.com wants to send these requests, um, that will... Um, that's where the case where the user's token will be used, and then um, the origin header will be attacker.com. So essentially, the, 
The threat model here is not to protect the server from abuse, it's to protect um, other applications in the browser from abusing the user's credentials to a certain API. Is that If, for instance, if I have a, a, a session on Dropbox, I'm authenticated to Dropbox, I can do to their API whatever I want. There's, I don't even have to follow browser restrictions. And if they don't protect against that, okay, I can screw over my own account or I can try to escalate the attack. But that's not the thing they want to protect with course. They want to avoid my application running in your browser from using your uh, session on Dropbox to start deleting stuff or executing stuff. And that's something that the server needs to check. Okay, if there are no more questions, um, thank you. And maybe I'll see you at dinner tonight, uh, who knows? Otherwise, uh, enjoy the rest of the course.